Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Hello, beautiful people. This is Debbie Dashinger. There's so much to celebrate. And I could tell you that I had a health scare and I just had a great health report today. And that made me so happy. I stopped at Starbucks. I got myself a coffee. I got my dog a puppuccino. I got my partner a coffee. So anyway, I'm going to fix this here, but I'm, I'm thrilled. I've been waiting for this date and it's so interesting I, you know, anyway, this is just coming through. So I'm going to say this, how this is happening. Last year, um, my mother got sick and she actually passed the day after my birthday. And I felt like that was a very loving thing for her to do. So happy almost passing anniversary, mom. And so she passed on June 28th. Um, I did feel like she really took into account, like, I don't want to die on my daughter's birthday. That would be funky for her every year to have that memory connection, that reference point. So it was very kind of her. And this year, the day before my birthday, I um, have this beautiful health report that I've been waiting for. Um, so I'm very happy about that. And I'm also going to be having a conversation today with somebody who I've not spoken with before, you may not have heard about before, but when I got his email, I was like, what, <laughs> what is this? This is cool. I need to know more. So we're all going to learn more together today. So beautiful people. Today, I am speaking with Graham Gorey, and we're going to be talking about shamanism and OMG. He is the same shamanic lineage as me, the Keto people, the Incas from Peru. That's so deep and beautiful. And his mentor was my mentor, right? So my, my original, no, not my original mentor, um, but every mentor I've had, all four of them have been Peruvian, woman or man. And this one in particular for both of us was very important in my life and in his too. So we will be talking about for him shamanism, channeling, and how humanity can move consciousness across timelines. This show, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger, won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards, won the COVOR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show, Welp Magazine, named Dare to Dream one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, and it is high-ranking under self-improvement in Apple Podcasts. If you're on YouTube with us, take a look at membership. I highly recommend you sign up and join because that's where the folks who become members, we're going to be able to do these privately, the interviews, Q and A's with our guests, and also some work with me. So sign up now. My Gaia TV episode is released. So go over to Gaia TV and click on Beyond Belief. That's the TV show with George Norrie. George interviewed me recently and about shamanism and extraterrestrials, in fact. So please support me. Go to Gaia TV. If you don't have a subscription, there will be a link in the notes so you can get a free Gaia TV subscription for two weeks. Also, in July, my shamanic energy healing program is opening up. I'm very excited to see the people signing up for that. And specifically, I am not teaching shamanism. I am gifting every single week a one-hour healing experience. So if you're at a point in your life where you're ready to up-level, you're ready to release darkness, obstacles, any kind of patterns that have been pervasive, and definitely bring in the new energy, right? The ascension energy, the dreams coming true. We came here to create big. I would love to work with you. So look for the link in the notes as well for the Shamanic Energy Program. It's starting really soon. So don't hesitate if you feel that yummy, yay, I want to do this. I am speaking on the Galactic Origins Cruise to the Yucatan in December. Link in the notes. Cannot wait. Unbelievable presenters. Beautiful days at sea. Going to sacred sites. And finally, also in September, I am speaking in Glastonbury, England, and that is sacred site territory. Uh, link in the notes. I'm a book writing coach. I also take your book to a guaranteed 
international bestselling status. And finally, I do some PR publicity work for folks who want to get booked on podcasts. If you would like to learn some of this information to do it on your own, I have a gift for you and it teaches you how. Go to debbie-inger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. My guest is Graham Gorey, who channels a non-human intelligence, who is one of the creators of the human genome. Graham began as a journalist working in Havana, as a translator, for, wow, amazing, for Fidel Castro at Cuba's largest newspaper, Granma. He was then hired by the New York Times in Mexico and later became the Associated Press's foreign correspondent in Bolivia during a time of social upheaval when Bolivia's indigenous leaders rose to power. While covering a story about global warming in Peru, he was introduced to the Caro Indians, protectors of the ancient shamanic wisdom. The Caro, who hid high in the Andes to escape the Spanish Inquisition, descended the mountains after nearly 400 years to share their teachings. Graham spent seven years learning their practices and became an initiate after receiving the rite of the womb. He then connected with a creator being who revealed a transformative message for humanity. As a direct transmission, Graham's first book, Electric Ape, is a collection transmitted from the correct creator being. Electric Ape is a guide outlining steps for humanity to move consciousness across timelines and undergo a metamorphosis into beings existing in anti-time. Wow. The book explains how humanity's junk DNA can activate dimensional shifts when Earth's magnetic field changes. Graham's work offers profound insights into Earth's current upheavals and humanity's evolutionary potential. You can learn more at his website, which is gramgory.com. And with that, I welcome Graham to the Dare to Dream show. It is so great to have you here today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm honored. Graham, I have to tell you, I had to keep stopping while I was reading your bio. I already have a bunch of things I want to ask you. And then I realize, looking back over your bio, it's like I could do a whole show with you just <laughs> based on the bio. I have yeah. so many questions. That's a fascinating life. So I feel like I almost have to stop there. Like you really had an incredible time, New York Times, Associated Press, being in Bolivia when the indigenous leaders rise to power, which is pretty cool. I'm mm -hmm. all about that. And then covering this global warming uh, story in Peru. So tell me, there you are covering this story. How were you introduced to the Caro Indians? Well, when we went deep into or high up into the Andes, um, I didn't actually meet any of the Caro there, but one of the, um, you know, at the at the bureau in La Paz in the office, the office manager was uh, Freddie Quispe, and he turned out to be yeah. Well, my Freddie Quispe, Singona. No, I don't think it was him. Different. But, oh, okay. Yeah. But my introduction into the Caro was kind of like, um, you know, I was imbued in their teachings in Bolivia, but I didn't actually begin. You know, I began with Alberto Violdo about a decade later, but I think, you know, it was kind of like I was introduced to them while in Bolivia. And yeah, being in Bolivia was just like, you know, it was a wild ride, you know, especially during that time. Um, Why do you say yeah. wild ride? Um, because, you know, when I got there, the president was uh, Gonzalo Lozano, I think his name was. And, um, you know, he could he could actually barely speak Spanish or he he or he he posed as um he spoke with a gringo accent you know and it was very interesting because he was kind of like what you know many would consider to be kind of like a puppet leader you know he was there protecting the interests of those that did not represent the indigenous culture 
So at that time, Evo Morales was, was like rising and he was about to be elected. So I was there during that time and there was a lot of social upheaval. And um, I had never, although I had lived in Cuba, I lived in Mexico. And I think for anybody who goes from here, from the United States into Latin American culture, um, you just see so much more life. You know, you mm. see much more birth and then you see much more death. But when I got to Bolivia, the amount of, of death that I was exposed to was actually, you know, traumatic. You know, the very first day I got there, and a lot, a lot of people know the pause is really high in elevation. And so physically, it's, it's a, you know, it's hard on the body. And I got there and the very, that very night at three o'clock in the morning, I get a call from the video producer. He's like, hey, man, like, we got to go. And I'm like, okay. And so we get in his Jeep and it's still dark. I have, you know, I have no idea where I'm at. But we end up going down this road down into the jungle. And there was a bus accident. And this road is terrifying. They call it the highway of death. And, you know, as dawn begins to break, you know, he leans over his shoulder. He's like, hey, check out, look out the window. And I looked to my left and like, there was literally nothing there. I mean, it was just like, you know, thousands of feet down into the jungle and all this mist was coming up. And yeah, it was, it was extremely jarring. Like it was, it was this bus accident where, you know, everybody died basically except for one man who was able to climb up thousands of feet from the jungle floor up into the Andes and report the crash. So yeah, it was just, um, yeah, it was, it was a very uh, raw experience, I would say. That sounds like it. Um, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not many people would go through something like that in the United States. And so you're introduced to the keto and then you say 10 years later, you start working with Dr. Alberto Viodo. And mm -hmm. for folks who don't know, he and his wife, Marcella Lobos, run the Four Winds Society. And that is a, well, they do a lot there. I won't even go there. But uh, tell me about that period of your life. What happens? Well, during, during that time of my life, I was going through... Um, my separation, which eventually became a divorce, but it was my spiritual awakening because it was extremely traumatic for me. And um, when I started going through this process, a friend of mine who was an acupuncturist said, hey, I have somebody who's doing very avant-garde um, therapeutic work, and I think you should speak to her. And so I did, and it ends up that she uses uh, MDMA and ayahuasca to unlock um, trauma. And so I said, yes, you know, being an adventurer, I, and in part because when I was in Bolivia, I met a lot of people who were on like the ayahuasca path. At that time, I didn't do it, but I ended up doing it. And when I did, something extremely unexpected happened. Um, it was a three night ceremony and during the ceremony i real i i became another being i became a very young african american who was a slave and i and i i've subsequently learned that during in ayahuasca there is a lot of african um motifs but this was like extremely personal and it was very tough because my biological mother was my mother in the ceremony during the experience, but she was a sex slave um, during the American slave epic. And it was just like so heartbreaking. I literally like didn't think I was going to be able to survive afterwards because it was just like such a heartbreak. And so I had a heartbreak on top of a heartbreak. And during that time, um, I realized that I felt like I was, I was actually, I had a soul possession. That's what I, I thought it was. And it was. And so when I got back from the three day ceremony, I was in my hometown and I was at this uh, coffee shop and there was a brochure on the table from a local shaman who was doing an introductory course on shamanic um, practices. 
And I was just extremely intrigued. So that's how I began. And then that's how I began my shamanic studies. And then I later met a woman who was a graduate of the Four Winds with Alberto Violdo. And I was really drawn to her energetically. And she, you know, she told me about the program and that's how I got involved in it. Wow, we, um, that's very interesting. I didn't have a pat, I'm assuming it's a past life experience that you had, unless it's archetypes you experienced somehow in this um, purge, I'll call it, you know, an emotional purge during ayahuasca. But I also have a similar story of how I got into all of this because I went to another country. I did ayahuasca for four nights back to back and and I had things happen. I was like very confused for a while but it put me on a path like the divine mm -hmm. knew exactly right what mm -hmm. to do and how to do it so okay you start learning this um you're intrigued and then how do you get to receiving the right of the womb and what happens for you there yeah so the the energy medicine course at the four winds was i believe an eight month uh, intensive course and at the end of the training, the last training or the last rite we received was from Marcella called the rite of the womb. And I remember um, it was it was interesting because as I was receiving the rite or right before it, I just I went into this tremendous yawning fit. And and I know that when I go into a yawning fit, something's happening. And I literally was having a hard time staying awake. And as Marcella began to to deliver the right, she actually stopped and she's like, hey, are you OK? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm OK, I think. But I remember thinking to myself, why is a man receiving the right of the womb? And um, I did receive it. And then I think maybe a couple of weeks later, we graduated. And right after graduation, I was connecting and this voice appeared and the voice said, I am here to get you out of this body and into the next one. And I had had episodes in my life of channeling. I knew there was something there. I knew there was a voice. And the voice had come, I think, three times beforehand, once in my 20s, once in my 30s, and then again in my mid 40s. And but this time it was very clear, you know, beforehand it was kind of like I didn't have control over it. I didn't have a command of it. But this time, like the, the voice was extremely clear and so was my reception to it. And I think most channelers talk about a process through which they go where they're being kind of groomed or developed. And so for me, the shamanic training, I think, was not only a profound energetic clearing of my my space, but it was also a training ground. And so once I started to receive the voice, um, I had to figure out what my relationship was with it, right? Because at first I was kind of like, I didn't really, I didn't think he, the being was talking to me necessarily. I just thought I was like listening, right? But no, it wasn't like that. And, um, you know, he started to talk about things that were really uncomfortable to me because as he was talking to me, he was also accessing I think my destiny or what my purpose in this life to not only receive this, but to deliver it. And so while I was fascinated and I wanted more information, I was also terrified by the idea that someday I was going to have to go out and share it as I am now. And he kept on asking me is like, at what point are you actually going to start believing me? Because what he was telling me, I was having a hard time accepting at a level of belief where, you know, it's like, okay, this is real. Well, let me ask you, because earlier, Graham, you said uh, during the ayahuasca experience that uh, thereafter you felt like you had some kind of a possession, right? If that's the way you described it or, or some kind of soul situation going on, is that at all connected to this being or did that get handled? Did that get, you know, was, did somebody come along who was able to relieve you of that? Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, I did a soul retrieval and all of that, a deep possession. I think the, I don't know, I don't have like a really clear understanding of why that happened. 
Um, what I do know is his name was Nestor. Nestor wasn't just like a slave. He was a very intrepid runaway slave. Like he would not accept his enslavement. And so he had this extremely deep and profound drive for freedom. Mm. And I think as we move along in this discussion, um, what the being, the creator being is channeling to me now, the most important, I think, aspect of it is he's saying humanity is at a point now where we can achieve dimensional freedom. We no longer have to be dimensionally enslaved. So I think that freedom slavery aspect um, is was really ex important. And I was, you know, to be honest, I was possessed. I don't really like that term, but anyway, you know, I, I inherited Nestor's soul when mm -hmm. I was about six or seven. So I had a good 30 years, you know, a full Saturn cycle of being in relationship with um, an entity you know, I guess you could say I was enslaved to a slave. Hmm. And so I think for anybody who reads the book, Electric Ape, um, the concept of being a slave is talked about a lot. And the being says like, look, you have to get really mature about the idea of being a slave. You actually want to be a slave because being a slave to a master is important when you want to become the master. If you don't you like your master, that? I don't understand. Can you give me an example of that? Well, I mean, I guess the example is is this: uh, what humanity is going through. Um, if we are graduating from our Earth bodies into the next dimension, um, we're not just kind of like going into nothing. We're actually moving into a higher form that's already established. So that form is the master, the master form. If that makes sense. So when in you order... say master form, do you mean like our our oversoul, or and I'm we're reconnecting with our oversoul, or source, or what is that? Okay, let's just dive into it, right? Um, so it's it's not like a being. It's you know it's us. We are. They call it the human metamorphosis or the great human morph. And basically, the way it's being shown to me is that we are divorcing our consciousness, which is like our ultimate power from this body and from this dimensional framework that we're, we're not only perceiving, but we're like projecting, we're electrically and magnetically tied to this earth realm. But we're in the process now, and they call it cosmic puberty, where the DNA that we possess that has not been ignited or has not been expressed is actually DNA that creates another form that they call a vehicle. And this vehicle is in, totally inside of us. You know, it's invisible, but it's inside of us. And as we pull our consciousness away from the earth reality, we begin to migrate it across this time barrier into the next dimension where we have they call it a vehicle and the vehicle is a sphere and it's like a body but you know there's no arms there's no appendages and we exist in the exact middle of it so consciousness becomes or our awareness becomes like um spherical or like a globe like a star basically and that's what i'm being taught on and so when they talk about a metamorphosis, they're talking about pulling our consciousness, our awareness away from this earth reality and moving it into this transitionary sphere where we undergo a metamorphosis and learn how to exist in the other dimension, which is very different than what we're living in now. Have you done it, Graham? Have you had the experience? Well, yeah, yeah, because... You know, when I watch other channelers work, um, to me, it seems it's like a it's a stream of information, right? And they just kind of like, you know, they get in and it's a stream. Um, it's not how it works for me. At the beginning, it was it was kind of like, okay, I'm hearing the voice, I'm hearing the voice. But now, 
they're like, we're not going to give you more information until you actually do the work because it'll be meaningless. Mm. And by the way, they, you know, they say that the first thing that you're going to lose when you move dimensions is the human mind. Mm. Because the human mind um, is kind of like the glue that holds together our perceptual awareness of our reality here. Mm. So when you move into the sphere and you think you, you get sucked out, right? Yeah. So I'm sorry, I forget, I forget your question. I was wondering about your personal experience of shifting dimensions, releasing your mind and um, going into the sphere, uh, going into the vehicle, if you're able to transport yourself a little bit back and forth. Yeah, and that's a really important process because um, it's like, it's a very disciplined practice. You know, part of, and, and it's also like a mixture of earth powers versus our next dimensional powers. And they say we're actually, all of humanity right now is existing in part in this reality, but there's another part of us that exists in the next dimension. And so you can move in between and they really, really like that because they say when the transition comes, you want to be glitch free. You want mm -hmm. to be fluid and know where you're going. And so, um, and like when I started doing it, it was, it was really awkward. And I, you know, I would kind of like dive in, you know, I'd go really fast and then get all confused. And, and they're like, no, go back and go in slow this time. You know, I'm assuming many of your listeners have done you know, plant medicine, but when I started doing plant medicine, and I think a lot of other people I've talked to have talked about this, like there's a lot of surgery that goes on, mm -hmm. you know, particularly for me, there was, especially on the right brain mm -hmm. and in the inner ears. And like, was oh, that, was that otherworldly surgery? Because I know totally. oftentimes on ayahuasca, there are mantis beings, insectoid beings, other beings from other galaxies and dimensions that come and literally do surgery on people. Yeah, I didn't see any of like insectoid um, beings, but I saw their machines, like the level of like yeah. technological detail. Yeah. I mean, it's, you could just tell it's like a, a way higher intelligence. And but I could hear the work and I could feel it. Um, and so, you know, I had no idea what was going on, but this was like, this happened a lot. You know, this was a, this was a, like a very consistent pattern in all of my plant medicine ceremonies. Mm. And it, it, you know, it was cleaning. And it, what I think was happening is they were preparing. Yeah. They're, they were hitting these, like preparing these gene frequencies um, so that they could be expressed. And I don't, you know, I think maybe just to kind of like complete this thought about where we're going, this dimensional shift. Yeah. Um, basically, what we're, what I perceive is happening is when we cross time barriers and get into the next dimension, we become capable of manufacturing gravity. The vehicle that we exist in exists in space time. Like what, what exists outside of Earth's atmosphere is what we're going to be living in. So we become basically an atmosphere unto ourselves and we create our own gravity. And it's absolutely fascinating to watch how this works because our organs, like our kidneys, our heart, yeah, like we, don't, we don't become something else. It's just that like our bodies begin to manufacture a different gravity, a different energy, and our bodies know what to do. It's 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 fascinating. Okay, there's there's so much amazingness <laughs> to unpack there. I want to. I'm going to actually take a step out before I deep dive into some of what you just said. Two things. First of all, I just for the audience' sake, you had brought up the right of the womb. And I am a Moon Aiki rites practitioner. I do the rite of the moon every new moon. 
right? And so every time there is a new moon, I do it. Yeah, there are, there's one process for a younger gal um, who's still menstruating. There is another process for, you know, it depends, I suppose, when anybody goes into menopause, um, that woman, that sage will have a different rite that is done. And when we do the rites, and I'll just speak for myself as a facilitator, I, we always invite the men and you might say, well, that's a, a right of the womb and it's a woman's right. And why would you do that? And the reason, well, there's many reasons. One of the reasons that we invite and love men to come to these rituals is first of all, men have been women in other lifetimes. Second of all, men came from a woman. A woman gave birth to each man who is in attendance. And third of all, because the men in their divine maleness, if you will, stand as the protectors of this circle. And of course, I know people who listen to the show are so evolved, so I'm really not worried, but I do like to be clear, you know, it's not that we as divine women, the divine feminine cannot support or take care of ourselves, but there is an energetic for the male, there's an energetic for the woman, and it is a really gorgeous practice when the male is there honoring the woman, the woman who gave birth to him, the women he's been, the feminine in him, right? Mm -hmm. Because we are all things. So mm -hmm. I wanted to give that explanation and it is a gorgeous ritual. And the second thing, as you were speaking, and I love this conversation because I'm into this. Um, I have been watching a TV show that I found by accident, <laughs> Um, on Apple TV called Dark Matter. And folks, if you haven't seen it, hi uh, highly recommended. So this gentleman who is a whiz devises a box, um, but he actually never goes through with creating the box, but it, it's total physics, quantum physics. And it's, it's like um, how you can pass through to go to another time and dimension. But unbeknownst to him, because... This is true for all of us. And it's beautifully represented in this TV show. Unbeknownst to him, the moment he made the decision not to build the box, but to instead marry the woman he loved and then went off and became a college professor and had a kid and all that, he split, which happens to all of us. We're constantly splitting with every choice we made. One part of us goes here, another part of us goes there. That's not a soul retrieval. That is literally us on different timelines. And so this other timeline, he becomes an unbelievable success. He's rich beyond whatever. He creates this box. It does what he set out for it to do. But the one thing he's sad about is he never married this woman because he realizes I have everything, but actually had I have her in my life as my partner, that would have been truly what I desired. So that's where the whole show goes like, whoa, because he does everything to get back to that life and so much ensues. I'm telling you this because it is a gorgeous representation of what happens to us when we hear this stuff that upon every choice, another piece of us splits off and takes a different timeline. It's almost impossible to think about, but when you watch the show, you see it and it's so easy to comprehend. It's mind blowing too. So I wanted to get all that out of the way. So folks want to have a better idea. And, and this in a way is on earthly terms, like these splits, right? Not these more cosmic, more uh, going out to a, another dimension. So let me get back to what you were sharing, Graham. Because you were saying... Um, you were talking about humanity moving consciousness across timelines. And I want to get to the part about undergoing a metamorphosis into beings existing in anti-time. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Sure. Do you mind if I take one quick step back and Please. the right of the womb? Um, yeah. So... The, the men receiving the right of the womb, I think, you know, there's, a, there's another level to that, which my guides have been talking about. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that in when human, when humanity graduates from this dimension to the next, 
Um, it's the men who carry the divine feminine energy. There, there is kind of like um, a reversal going on because when they talk about this metamorphosis into or into the crossing the time barrier into this sphere that they call a vehicle, they also call it a time embryo. And, and when you read the book, you'll see that like, when we go into the next dimension, there's not going to be any differentiation between the sexes, but of course we're on earth and it's very important. And they say that when in earth bodies, we go through puberty, girls hit it first and then the boys second, right? And so there is a division of, you know, of functionality. And they say when we go through cosmic puberty and when we birth ourselves into the next dimension, it's the men who hit puberty first and then the women second. And so this idea of this time embryo that we all have within ourselves that we're investing with our consciousness. And as we invest it with our consciousness, it gains gravity. And as it gains gravity, you can literally feel the genes begin to kind of like pop. You know, the deeper you go, the more weight you're able to manufacture, it expands the vessel. And, but anyway, I, I just think it's really fascinating that it's, it appears to me that it's the men's purpose at this time in humanity to create this space between Earth's dimension and the next dimension that we're going to. And, and they say what's happening is that within Earth's sphere or atmosphere, humanity is going to be creating another bubble that's in between what we know to be our reality and space or this, you know, ether fluid that space is. And in between these two, we create the sphere. And in the sphere, we undergo a metamorphosis, just like a butterfly goes through a metamorphosis, but it's not physical. It's completely, I mean, it's completely real, but it's not, there's no carbon, right? It's energetic, it's, you're saying? It's completely, it's gravitational and it's magnetic. Okay. So talk, talk about that a little bit. So how does Earth's magnetic and gravitational field shift, how do those shifts trigger the activation of our junk DNA? Like, I don't, I don't know, like scientifically, I'm not sure, but they just, you know, they just kind of gave me an intellectual framework to understand it. You know, they said like, you know, earth is going through a major transformation as well. And they're like, the fact that you're on earth isn't accidental being on earth, they say that being human on earth, the purpose of being human on earth is to create what they call God seed. You're here creating God seed. And they say that as earth moves in the galaxy, it, it is, it, I guess it's like exposed to different, I'm not sure areas of the universe where Earth's magnet magnetism or its gravitational field shifts a little bit. And they say that this is predictable, like they know this is going to happen. And they um, designed the human genome to begin to um, hit what they call a cosmic puberty to expand. And that they say is what's causing so much kind of like anxiety in, in the world, but it's that anxiety, that anxiety is a symptom of our shift into the next dimension. And, you know, they also point out that it's not just going to happen. Like, you know, they, they, they point out that humans think that, you know, evolution just kind of like happens and it's just like, it's done, but they said, if you want to graduate from one dimension to the next, you actually have to do the work. And the work is all based upon your dominion over your consciousness, because consciousness is what ignites universes. Wow. This sounds like ascension on crack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, like, I have no idea how this lands with people, you know, like. But I mean, it's really beautiful because we keep hearing, you know, 5D, da, 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 da. And then some people channel like these beings, this collective I channel, they're in the ninth dimension, the 12th dimension. And then we hear about what's happening to us here on earth and that we're literally physically, emotionally, everything, you know, with some of the discomfort or like you said, the anxiety that people are experiencing, like it's real, you know, that there is a lot of changes at a cellular DNA level going on. And when I hear you describe this, it does, it sounds like, um, you know, level, the next level, a conversation about ascension. So the question is, people who are watching, people are listening, what steps can they take? So they begin the process of moving their consciousness, very important, and moving their consciousness away from Earth's gravitational field. Can they do this at home on their own? And yeah. if so, how? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's in the book. It's in Electric Ape, which is on Amazon. Um, the first step is to stop time. And they differentiate stopping time from it's not stop thinking. You know, stop thinking is a lot different than stop time, because when you stop time, you're actually commanding um, a knowing within your body to begin to separate begin to separate like the energy of Earth's atmosphere. And when you do that, when you begin to stop time and expand it slightly, you create a little pocket of what they call anti-time or like a vacuum. And then as you do this, you begin to expand your consciousness outward and create, you begin to form the bubble, right? And as you do this, it triggers your body to begin to manufacture gravity. And that happens through your kidneys. Your kidneys are what create gravity in your body. And it's, it's, it's like, it's a coordinated movement. It really is. And it all begins with, well, the first step actually they say is like to stop thinking, like literally stop your thoughts and then allow the weight of your hemispheres to actually drop just slightly. And you can do this. You know, like if you have enough awareness, enough, enough control, you could actually like command yourself to stop thinking, allow the weight of your hemispheres, because I mean, our brains are so tense all the time because we're just like thinking all the time and focusing on the projection that we're also holding up. I think a lot of people don't realize that we're also holding up the reality that we're simultaneously bringing in. We're, we are electrically connected. And when I wake up in the morning now, um, like there's always like a little lapse of time when I wake up before my brain kicks in and you can feel it. It's different. You're like in that in-between state and I could, and then I can just feel my brain kind of like click or just like, like energetically kind of like suck in. But anyway, so as you allow the weight of your hemispheres to drop a little bit, that actually creates that, that movement of consciousness where you can stop time and begin to expand it. And once you feel that happening, you can expand it further. And then that's when you really gain dominion over your consciousness. And as you do this, as you sweep it outward and you create this sphere, and you, you make sure you stop thinking, like if you ever start thinking, you're just gonna reverse the whole process and like, you know, chuck yourself out of the system. You, that's when, and that's why they like to do it slowly. Like when you start to do this, your body knows what's happening. It's kind of like building a cocoon, right? And as you build this cocoon, the kidneys begin to drop in weight and they pull time down. I know this is going to sound very bizarre, but if you do it, you can actually feel it happening. And then once, and I find this fascinating as well, but they've shown me and they've explained that once your kidneys pull time down, they actually become what they call a time diaphragm within this sphere. 
you know, our diaphragm now like br pulls air in and out of our lungs, but in the sphere, it actually creates like a vacuum within the sphere that's operating against space itself. And that's how we, we move against gravity. That might be a little bit too far, but I just- I don't know. It's fascinating. And people who want, you know, can start to experiment with that. I think that's a good thing to share. I assume listening to you, knowing about your book, that you are no longer a professional journalist. Have you now shifted over this full-time channeling author, et cetera? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually on July 26th and 27th, I'm going to be holding a free masterclass. And the masterclass is on um, gaining dimensional vision, like being able to actually see what it's like in the next dimension. Like we're not going to be like traveling in space or anything like that. It's nothing like that. It's just how to actually begin to create this fear and, and begin to have vision that's magnetic and electrical. And it's, you know, has nothing to do with our eyes. And if people are interested, do they go to gramgory.com? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe. It'll be on my website. Okay. So I'm going to go back to uh, the Inco Keto Peruvian shamanic lineage that you and I both share. And I have a beautiful quote from my mentor and yours, uh, Dr. Alberto Viodo. And he said, we must think of ourselves as a tribe, as an international community that has come together with a common purpose of being initiated into the process. We all have to do it together. There is a link that happens where the growth, my growth, depends on the other's growth around us. We can no longer take these steps by ourselves. We have created a synergistic community. We must take a step toward knowledge together. What are your thoughts about that, Graham? Well, my question is, what's the process? And that quote, what do you think the process is? I personally, I think it's the work that he's given us. So uh, he's, I'm trying to think um, of the four Peruvian Inca, it's just amazing. Like there's a reason which was not mindfully designed by me, but it just so happened the female and all the males I've work, worked with all from Peru. And um, at least three of them of the Inca Quero people. And so I believe strongly, now you talked about in your bio, it says uh, the people who hid from the Spanish Inquisition came down and they were there for 400 years in the high Andes and it was finally safe for them to come down. But another thing that happened with them is that they also, they know the prophecies, right? They know the prophecies of what we're in, what's to come. We're in the middle of a Pachacuti, and I could talk at length about that. Pachacuti means writing things, the time to make things right. That is what we're in. It also means there's a lot of chaos before there's right. Um, and so they, the shamans, the indigenous knew we need to start gifting the Western world and other parts of the world ayahuasca. We need to start gifting them with this knowledge, with these practices, with shamanism. And so I believe that people like you and I who like passionately feel this call for something, there is a greater reason. And even outside of us and whatever, you know, deep connection we have from other lives there, there is also this connection that we're being given a legacy. I mean, Dr. Alberto, I don't know exactly how old he is, late 70s, 80, around there, but however much longer we have this amazing, amazing human being who is doing everything to disseminate this information, mm -hmm. now you and I take it out in the world. So I think when he says, um, well, when we think of ourselves as a tribe, he means an IU, right? The quick, the kettle word for tribe. And he's saying a common purpose of being initiated into the process. And I think underneath everything you and I learn shamanically or have done in trades or have a gift people with or charge people for, whatever that is, that 
we are bequeathing this process out there. You know, uh, Dr. Alberto always talks about the importance of cleaning our luminous energy field. And that by virtue of doing what you and I have done, we are impacting. It's not just impacting us and healing us, but it ripples out into all of humanity. So that's what I think he's talking about. I know that was a long answer, but I think mm -hmm. he's saying we are the next ones to do this. And as we do this and be this, it influences the rest of society. Yeah. And the ultimate answer is love, of course. Yeah. Yeah. When when I when I heard the word process, when I was going through the training, um, Dr. Alberto stopped with the idea that um, well, the prophecy of the caro is that there's going to be a new human arising from the old, like literally. Um, and that wasn't part of the training. In in a, I, fo I follow Alberto. And he alludes to it, but it's not part of his core. And I think that's what he kind of left for the others of us to, to figure out. And I think that's where we're at in humanity. I mean, I think that's where we're, I think that's why the Caro, you know, took the measures that they took to survive. And, you know, if, if you watch Billy Carson, he talks about the Peruvians being um, lineage holders from, from ancient Egypt. And so I do believe that humanity is graduating from the form that we exist in now, and we are going someplace else, and it's not on Earth, <laughs> you know? And, and I, I feel extremely fortunate because I, you know, I feel like I'm part of the process of receiving this information that could be of service to people who are really dedicated yeah. to this process because just because we're here on earth doesn't mean we're all going to be graduating that might not be what our our ultimate purpose is but i think it is for some you know one of the things you talk about in your book graham electric ape it suggests that earth is changing and so are we so can you be specific as to the planetary changes and the human changes that are happening in sync right now yeah, and this is really edgy, and and this is the part that made me feel really uncomfortable. Um, and they talk about it openly in the book. They say, um, they say, like, you know, the human body is going to go extinct. You know, like, and it's they say it's like this massive kind of like cultural diversion, or ta it's so taboo that nobody even thinks about it. But they're like, you got to get real. Like, look at the fossil bed. Like nothing lasts forever. <clears throat> and they say that the point of extinction for humanity is also the point of birth. It's the point of dimensional birth. And and they say it's it's not far off. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't mean to be alarmist or anything like that, but it is, you know, it's uncomfortable to think about, like, okay, it's you know, it's true. We are gonna go extinct. But yes. they ask. Let, let me ask you a question when you say that. Um, because a lot, like there are beings, I have people on the show and they channel beings who are much higher dimensional, uh, way advanced civilizations than us here on earth. And like, they don't even understand us with all the war and all the hatred and the racism. It's like they would never. Right. Mm -hmm. And they are not in physical form. And so mm -hmm. it is very difficult for them to like, literally come be here and have a conversation with an earthling so to say because they are pure energy is that what you are referring to that we will ascend our everything will change our energetics will change so much that we will become energy and not a solid being yeah absolutely like during the the transition um or what some people call ascension we're not going to be in humanoid forms, you know, and for me, that's always, you know, even before I started channeling this information, I was always kind of like, you know, intuitively, I was just kind of like, well, are you saying that when we ascend, we're going to be, you know, what, we're going to look like this or what, you know, and my guides are like, not at all, like, you're not, you're not going to be on earth, you know, 
not only are you not going to be on earth, you're, you're going to be in a totally different medium. Like the fluid that you're going to exist in is not, you're not going to be like coddled and protected within earth's atmosphere. You don't get that anymore. You have to create your own atmosphere and that's what it is. And so it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like the Protestant Reformation when Martin Luther was like, you know, I don't need, we don't need the popes to be intermediaries between, you know, the source and the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And the, the human metamorphosis, as it's being explained to me, is kind of like that. We, we don't, I'll say we don't need earth anymore. I don't mean like disparagingly, but we become earth herself. That's part of the metamorphosis. The spherical body that we inherit is like a replica of Earth. It has its own atmosphere, which is a lens. That's what our consciousness becomes. It becomes this like lucid container. The lucid container is electrified by the neurons in our gut. I had heard that before that our gut is actually a brain, and mm -hmm. it's true. Right. Like, you, you know, as you get deeper into this process, you can actually perceive visually what the sphere, because it is just like this huge eye. It's really hard to comprehend, like, what would it be like to be the absolute middle of a star? And how would you perceive from that? Mm -hmm. And I don't think our brains can actually conceptualize mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's the barrier between the, you know, the dimension, the dimensionality that we're able to comprehend now. And the next one is that how do you actually perceive gravitationally? And yeah. when you listen to the physicists talk, like um, Donald Hoffman, like it's fascinating. The physicists are using the exact same language. You know, they say like Einstein's theory of space time. They're like, it doesn't, it's not real. It's not true. That's, that's a theory from our perceptual framework. But he's saying like all the physicists, they want to know what it's like to actually perceive outside of our headset, they call it. And this is the process. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. It really is fascinating. And, you know, I don't feel uncomfortable listening to it. I've always, I um, deeply appreciate my body and its strength and totally. all it for a million reasons, right? And it's fun to have one and there's a lot you can do with it. And there's always been an aspect of me since I'm a little girl that has not been fully comfortable in a body. And I'm very clear that's because of my many incarnations that were different expressions that were not this, this density. And so that actually sounds very cool to me when you talk about that and all the possibilities, the freedom, frankly, is what comes up for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, Graham, because we're here at the end. What haven't you said? What have we <sighs> not talked about that you feel like you really want to share with the audience or they should know? I don't know if there's something that I want to share. I just, you know... The hardest part of this is making it relatable. You know, I just, I really, really, really like deeply in my heart want to, to make sure that, you know, I can, I can clearly, cause it's so hard. It's so hard to put into words, the feeling of being in a, you know, a, a vehicle an organic structure that your body can manufacture and what that actually feels like and hopefully make it understandable to other other people so but yeah i think that's it and we're here at the end this is dare to dream graham what do you next dare to dream what are your future dreams and your future goals my dream is to to com you know to completely go through this metamorphosis and to experience it and to teach other people how to do it that's that's my dream because i do believe that that humans at this time have the ability in our earth bodies to actually pull this off because nobody's going to pull it off for us 
at the end of the day, like if we want to evolve, it's up to us. And um, to me, it's just like the greatest adventure that could possibly exist. And I think it's amazing that I have the opportunity to receive this information and to share it and to teach it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing it with us today and for your bravery in coming out with all of this and allowing this to be expressed through you. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for having me and for acknowledging the bravery because, yeah, it is scary. <laughs> and only the beginning, my friend. And so, folks, if you would like to sign up for his class, get his book, learn more about him, you can go to his website. It's grahamgory.com. It's G-O-R-I dot com. And also, you can go to my website, debbie com. Sign up for my shaman class there, also for the Galactic Origins Cruise. And I end today's show with this quote from Terence McKenna. Shamanism is essentially a living tradition of alchemy that is not seeking the stone, but has found the stone. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. And if you're listening on a podcast, head on over to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger and check out what we look like animated and real and also join the membership there so you can work with me and some of my guests privately. Next week on the show is the amazing Tony Gazi. He channels the praying mantis beings. Thank you so much for being with us today. What a joy always to be with you guys. Stay safe, stay healthy, and create all your dreams into your reality.